Hello folks, how's it going? So, with no One Piece chapter this week, to like check out other shows that I've been looking forward to ch seeing, Suicide Squad Isekai. As of right now, I believe the fourth episode dropped yesterday, so kind of caught up. Side note, the first three episodes I watched in subbed, and the fourth episode I watched dubbed. So, so usually, I don't really check out most isekai anime. I knew I was going to make an exception for Suicide Squad because number one, I'm a fan of Suicide Squad and I, I'm i not a hardcore DC fan or a comic book fan, but I do like Suicide Squad, Justice League and Teen Titans as far as DC is concerned. As far as Marvel's concerned, it's X-Men. So I will be checking out X-Men 97, by the way. The other reason is because even though this is an isekai anime, we don't really get this type of stuff when it comes to like DC. It's kind of a new spin on things. The studio in charge of this anime is which studio are going to be involved with the One Piece remake anime, which whenever that gets announced as far as the date within the next month, I'm assuming. When I'm looking forward to a new anime or a new season, I kind of give it the three episode rule. Considering what we've got so far, I'm definitely going to be checking out the rest of the episodes because I really like what we've got so far. Obviously, which studio are behind this, but also you have Warner Brothers putting their stamp on this as well. But I was willing to make an exception for this series, but I'll get to that by the end because there's a lot to dissect within these four episodes. But speaking of sub, it's kind of interesting that Amanda Waller is voiced, I believe, by the same voice actor as Frieza and Cooler and by extension Frost from Dragon Ball. So that's actually really cool. If I, I'm assuming, because it sounded very, it sounded very similar. It starts off with Joker and Harley being chased by police. By the way, I love the designs when it comes to like the this anime. Like Harley, obviously, kind of looks similar, but it, as far as Harley Quinn, the Joker has a unique and cool looking design. I will say that they look extremely young. By the way, they look like they're in the teens. I don't know their age in this series, but they look they come across as teenagers to me. Maybe it does make perfect sense considering what Joker was saying about creating a new world. That's something you would expect somebody who's very young to say. What's interesting about this is they're getting chased by police. By the way, I love the car that they're in. The way it looks like Joker is like steering the car with a piano with piano keys because I don't see a wheel anywhere. That's really sick. Like avoiding the police by causing destruction throughout the city. That's pretty dope while playing the piano. So Harley puts the brakes on because they pull up to a bar. She goes in, but it's a setup pretty much. She gets ambushed and the Joker gets ambushed by the police. He escapes, but Harley escapes through a, escapes to the roof where she's met. I have to say, I really like Katana's design in this series. In this series, I thought it was really dope. We got our first action and fight scene in the episode, so this was actually pretty cool to see. For the short time we those two clashed, at, it wasn't anything over the top or oh my god, amazing like like Demon Slayer level, but it was pretty epic for what we got. And it looks like Katana is going to be the rival to. Harley Quinn anyway, so I'm looking to see what these two are capable of when they when the next time they throw hands, so that's cool. Hey, Katana gets the better of Harley Quinn. After that, half a year goes by, and that's when Amanda Wallen pretty much puts the Suicide Squad to work, And but this time, because I find it interesting that the Joker was talking about creating a new world. Meanwhile, you have Amanda Wallen, who is like pretty much trying to open up a new world, opening, opening up a portal or gate by using a a test subject now we don't get to find out who that test subject is i'm kind of hoping we will or get some information about that because that's really curious like the fact that she was able to power up a a gate that goes into another world so that may become crucial so like i said half a year goes by amanda wallen she she lets the members of the Suicide Squad out of solitary confinement with the deal that they actually help out and they go into this world. And we kind of get a reasoning in episode two. They get blackmailed into it because this, them have the explosive devices in their necks or the explosive chips in their necks which will blow up if they try to escape or try to like run away. They'll go off. So obviously they're screwed. Also Deadshot's daughter is being threatened so he's obviously got to join in. So You also had Clayface who was trying to hit on Harley Quinn. But Harley's having none of that. But I do like the fact we get some interesting quirks between the group. One of the best aspects of these initial episodes is the dynamic between the Suicide Squad, obviously. With the way the Witch Studio have handled the interactions, I really appreciate. 
because some of them are just straight out over the top and hilarious. Obviously, it blends in with Harley's personality. It's interesting because after this, they get as they get assigned aboard an aircraft where they go into another world. They're already in the Isekai world, by the way. After this, guard named Adam gets assigned to him. I mean, what a joke he was! Like he got he didn't even last three minutes. Like he ends up getting killed with along with two pilots who got shot. He ends up dying in the crash. And before then, I mean, you know, this guy was a total waste of space when he was trying to uncuff Harley Quinn, the explosive chips in their neck. Harley's like, are you sure you want to do that? Because I can latch onto you and go and go boom. So, and he was completely pissing himself after that. So yeah, what an absolute joke. The, the explosive tags that they have in the necks will go off in 72 hours. So obviously that's a problem too. Because the two pilots got shot, they end up, crash landing into the isekai world among in in the midst of a battle between royal guards of that of that world a kingdom belonging to that world they're fighting against a group of goblins i guess it wouldn't be an isekai without goblins right you get they crash land in the middle of a conflict and they the goblins and the guards notice this which leads into like the goblins trying to attack them or at least trying to corner them it looks like they're being cornered all until the leader of the this the goblin force, I guess. The blood on the spear gets on Harley Quinn's cheek. She pretty much goes psycho and all hell breaks loose, literally. This flips the switch and Harley Quinn, oh, you want to play? Let's go. So I love how when Harley Quinn becomes unhinged after getting blood on her cheek, you have King Shark out of nowhere just busting out of the aircraft. like. And after that, it's pretty much chow time, so... After that, Deadshot jumps up to a wing and actually takes out the leader of the Goblin Force. So, it's pretty much GG. By the way, I gotta say, when it comes to like the unhinged ex facial expressions, when it comes to like Harley Quinn, they really, not Wit Studio really not knocked out of the park. So, I, got I gotta say that there's some expressions that, are re that really stand out to me, especially within these first four episodes. Especially with the ending of the ep fourth episode, Jesus Christ. Cecile, what the guards leading, the royal guards here, they're, they're witnessing this, so this leads them to help it out. The kingdom, going forward. So I gotta say, Clayface, when it comes to like trying to understand the language barrier, when it comes to like this, the royal guards, is abs he absolutely sucks because he, he's trying to communicate with them by reading their facial expressions, by, but he absolutely sucks at translations because the moment he tries to communicate, he obviously offends them because it throws them in the slammer in the isekai world. So, yeah, so that was kind of funny. But there's some interesting other characters as well. And I was going to mention this earlier. There were some members of the Suicide Squad that were kind of absent. We've got Peacemaker, obviously. We've got King Shark. We've got Dead Shark. We've got Clayface and obviously Harley Quinn. That's pretty much how episode one ends. But I do like the fact during the credits we do get some very interesting players shown. One of them being Katana. So, she's in this world, that's revealed, which bleeds into episode 2, but there's some interesting other characters as well, and antagonist, obviously Katana's one of them, we get, we also find out Rat Chaser is another, who, let's be honest, episode 3 and episode 4, he turns out to be an absolute joke, I, that, those, the, Katana and Rat, Rat Chaser were the only two I kind of recognised, it had a back shot, there was one, there's one that looked like they was wearing a lab coat. Yeah, I also had another chick who's like covered up, who's also in the opening prominently. So I'm, I don't think they're a joke. Rat Chaser ended up being a joke, but Katana is obviously badass as hell. Like I said, I already like a design. You also have a female creature within that tree that they're standing in front of, and that's how the episode ends. So I can't wait to see what these characters can do. Like I said, Rat Chaser was a joke. I don't think the rest are jokes. Like the woman looks stands out the most. Katana's already badass. She already she already defeated Harley Quinn, so we know what she can do. We played into episode two and we actually get the opening and the ending. The opening the opening song is Another World by Tomoyasu Hote, which I guess the, the title of the song is very simplistic, but the visuals and the song itself are very effective. So, what I thought, obviously, the ending, the ending song is Go Get Us by the VTuber Mori. I kind of knew that already because that was kind of revealed separately. I'll give my thoughts on that because it does bleed into the ending of episode two. But, 
yeah, for what it was, I, I enjoyed the opening and ending. I thought they were really good songs. With ep episode two, it pretty much focuses on the Queen of the Kingdom going over the battle of involving the Royal Guards and the Goblin Force. So she says that it's, you call that a victory because it won't end until we squash every one of them. We also get introduced to the Princess Fiona, who immediately spot pays attention to the Suicide Squad in action, but more importantly, pays attention to Harley Quinn, which I don't find it could be to be a coincidence. The two just happen to look like one another. So that grabs her attention. Meanwhile, in the, in the slammer, belonging to the Royal Guards here, nonchalantly, Clayface just w w walks on out of there through the bars by turning into Clay. And then he's, a, he's literally about to ditch the rest of the crew. But then Harley Quinn literally... Yells out, hey, jailbreak, jailbreak. And that this brings in two guards. And you also have, like, Peacemaker grabbing a hold of... You ain't going anywhere, buddy. Who grabs a hold of Clayface. He can't go anywhere. They slap the cuffs on him. And apparently, these cuffs nullify his abilities, which is a problem. At least for him, it is. But yeah, he was literally about to, like, betray everybody. Bye-bye. Like, See you later. But like I said, the, the dynamic between the crew is fucking fantastic. It's, later on, things really pick up because... But again, Clayface completely miscommunicated with the Goblin Force. I guess the boss of the Goblins, who Clayface is sitting in his seat, so he's like, get out of my seat. And then Clayface is trying to reason with it. It's like, okay, I'll get out of your seat. But he can't communicate well with him because he's trying to read the facial expressions. It doesn't go well for him. He completely insults him, and he gets punched in the face for it. Meanwhile, they have the, like, the soup that's been for the Goblins, you got Harley who doesn't give a shit, who's just eating the whole soup. Obviously, it's disgusting for her, but it just pisses off the, the boss of the Goblin Force. And then it just, like, sends him off in a rage. He's about to punch Harley, but in comes Peacemaker to block the punch. After that, Harley jumps in, throws the ball, the soup ball, in his face as, along with the soup. And then just drop kicks him after that, after that, grabs the soup ball and starts beating the shit out of his face. So that was great. After that, after beating up on the, on the boss of the Goblin Force, in comes more guards, and we kind of get introduced to like their abilities, like their weapons are more advanced because obviously it's the Isekai world, so obviously they have to have weapons to nullify their abilities, otherwise they'd be fucked. So the the bats are magic bats, and apparently you can pin them down with magic or heavy gravi or heavy gravity. So that gets their asses thrown back in the slammer. But this was the most important part of the episode where they get they meet up with another guard. Of, that worked under Amanda Wallen, and that being Rick Flagg, and apparently he was sent there along with another crew before this crew ended up in the Isekai world. They went there, and what we learned in episode three, it looks like they ditched him, and then Rick ends up getting thrown in in the slammer as well. He doesn't really ma contribute much right now. The only thing he did useful was actually communicate with King Shark because he knows his actual name. Because it, King Shark was like getting hungry and he's about to chow down on the rest of the crew to like help them escape, they can get more food. So he, King Shark just busts out the jail door. Meanwhile, you have two guards show up. King Shark busts through the jail door. You have Dead Shark take out the take out one of the guards with two stones. That was pretty badass. And then Harley Quinn goes in, grabs one on the guards' bat, and then gets up, gets an Isekai anime power up, and then just swing and hits the shit out of one of the guards and so, so they end up causing a prison break and a, and release some of the goblins that are actually help them out i like how it's peacemaker that coaches them to, so as all hell breaks loose it's within the prison hall and you also have the music kicking in with the vocals as well at the the boss of the goblin force or the goblin squad at this case ends up like forming an alliance with harley quinn and they use that to tune after that. What turns into a fight scene ends up becoming a rave. Like, you got like disco lights, rave lights, illuminating. This was, this scene was actually outlandish. You had like, you have that clay face along with a group of goblins dancing to the music. But he's, as he's doing this, he's got one of the guards and he's just swinging around with clay. I thought that was absolutely hilarious and over the top. Following this, you got Harley Quinn that's like decorating because she picks up a mop and decides to use paint against the guards she's painted the wall but i love how they like use that in the fight scene they changed the background in the harley quinn was in as she took him out with paint that was hilarious they structure that scene 
to coincide with the ending song and the ending visuals because I mean for Christ's sake like I say we had Clayface and the group of goblins dancing in the ending visuals you had Amanda Wallen who was who was dancing to go get us so they take over the prison ward and then in comes Cecile along with his, a group of guards and pretty much I love Harley's response here oh you're gonna need more than this bunch to take us down we go from there to episode three and clearly they start off with a a scene from the future because we see the we see the squad in their casual gear and not in their prison gear so i actually like when episodes do that when when shows actually do that when they give you a glimpse of the future but you don't know how they got there that's really that was really a cool little touch there after the opening you clearly see them back where they were if outside the pr prison ward greeted by Cecile he's pissed because they're like, causing a r riot here so in comes Rick Flagg and at, at this point he becomes absolutely useless he tries to communicate with Cecile the guard it doesn't it doesn't work out because he doesn't know what he's saying he's like insulting them without knowing and it just gets him in more hot, hot water but then Cecile thinks about what Pri Princess Fiona said about wanting to do er er she can anything she can to like bring the war to an end quickly so that kind of gets him to like, okay, lower, lower your swords and let's let them into the palace to have an audience with the queen. So the squad enters the palace with the queen and, and a bunch of royals. And, and we also see the princesses there who actually, and this is the first time these two have actually met. So that, that was actually interesting. Now it's going to be interesting to see what type of influence she has on the princess going forward. But the way it comes off is like, pretty much the version of Harleen Quinzel. So Rick Flagg is trying to explain the situation about why they're here and trying to get find a way to leave and get and move about freely. But the problem is like the the squad they the, the group he brought with him end up it looks like they betrayed him and ended off with the enemy. Now it's important to know in episode two he does go on to say to Katana lead the group lead you here was she in charge of leaving you here? So I thought that was kind of interesting that he said that. So we, can't, we find out the route that was with Rick Flagg. Either abandoned him or something else happened. But I don't know why they would say that. Or highlight that if that wasn't the case. Especially as coming from Deadshot. And by the way the Queen actually uses a spell so they can communicate better. So they actually understand each other. So that was actually pretty cool. I mean which opens up the door. For Harley Quinn to say whatever the fuck she wants in front of the Queen. That was hilarious. I mean, Harley Quinn does not give a shit. But it ends up like they do end up helping them out because the werewolves that actually, well, we find out used to be allied with the kingdom, ends up betraying them. Though they've overthrown a fort that actually belongs to the kingdom, so they need to take that back. But they also need to move about freely because they need to they need to reset the timer on the explosive devices. So that's a problem too. So Harley Quinn is like, yo, we'll do this, but you better give us our, give us back our clothes. So we see them dressed up back in their threads. So that was actually how it ties in with the beginning scene of the episode where you had Harley Quinn spectating on the fight that's going on between the werewolves and the, and the royal guards. So so the werewolves that are actually, they've been, they've been caught up. They've been, they look like they've been through hell and Deadshot says, oh, they've been, we must have gone through some hellish training, and Harley Quinn's like, no, no, no. They they've been man they've been brainwashed, and uh, obviously, Harley Quinn's like experience is the reason why she knows that. So good on her for recognizing that because it's, that's exactly what it turned out to be. And because of this, Deadshot is like thinking, huh? Animals, mind control, and obviously there was a group that headed into this Isekai world before the Suicide Squad. So. He puts two and two together and figures out who it is. They go inside the fort and they take out a bunch of we werewolves. We find out Rat Chaser is the one manipulating the werewolves. Deadshot recognizes him and he said, "Oh, he's on the impression that oh he'll ha he'll help us out. Like he'll he'll be thrilled to, thrilled to see me after what helping him out back in the day. Doesn't look like he was helping him out at all. In fact, his presence just pissed off Rat Chaser even more. But like I said before, he was an absolute joke. He's First off, it's not even him that's like controlling the the werewolves. It's the staff that he's holding. So Deadshot's presence just pisses off Rat Chaser within this action sequence. There's a scene where P Peacemaker fires at Rat Chaser twice. The first time, a werewolf 
kind of gets in the way and blocks the blocks the shot. You got Clayface taking care of business. He brings he brings a, a group of werewolves down under the air, down into the ground. So that was pretty cool. That leaves him exposed. Peacemaker takes another shot, but in comes Katana like a boss, deflects the bullet, and I love the smile she gives because she scuppers off with Rat Chaser sparing him. But this just pisses off Harley Quinn, and I, this is what I said about the. And you got Harley Quinn looking very unhinged right now. Now seeing that Katana's here, all hell's gonna break loose when those two finally meet up again. I can't wait to see that. So they take him back the fort, but the problem is the fort is in ruins because they. They went way over the top, so they did damage. So this ends up getting them thrown back in the slammer. Which which brings us to episode four, which in my opinion was like the most is where we got the most information about this world and well, at least some information about this world. By the way, I love how it starts off with Joker and Harley Quinn be as they've been like hunted down by a group of criminals, as later on they get described as rodents or rats, which plays into how Rat Chaser gets taken down later on in the episode. So I love how that ties itself up. But they're obviously still locked up for causing so much damage to the fort. Princess Fiona meets them in the prison cell. This is the first time they're exchanging words with each other. So that's interesting. But like I said, the way it comes off, like she's putting, it's like, oh, I saw you looking at me earlier and you were eyeing me up earlier. So what is it you want? What is it you want to say? Princess Fiona doesn't really say anything. You read the dialogue coming off Harley Quinn. Like she's she's straightforward. So I, she doesn't hold any punches as far as what she thinks. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So, but they did their job. So this gives them a chance to like bargain in this case. You also get another backstory when it comes to like Princess Fiona. Who's thinking about when she was interacting with a group of friends who are commoners, but she's with royalty, so she can't do that, according to her mother. And it becomes very critical because we find out she's friends with a werewolf, she's friends with an elf, and she's friends with a human. Obviously, she being human as well, but she's she's more royal, so the boy that she made friends with ends up getting killed because we see her in, what, standing in front of a gravestone. I'll get back to that scene by the end because it's going to tie in with my final thoughts of what I think about where this is going. She... She attends the meeting as the Suicide Squad yet again have an audience with the Queen. And this time, kind of get the lay down on what's going on in what, when it comes to like the enemy here. So, there was bickering back and forth. There was They clashed back and forth, but there was nothing too major. If you look up where the battle lines were drawn, on the, episode, on the side of the Royal Guards, we had elves and werewolves. And somewhere along the way, the, were, the elves and the werewolves end up switching sides and helping out... And we come to find out, we know the reason why that is. We, so we kind of get the law as far as the way things go down. Obviously, we know the reason why they switch sides is because Rat Chaser and the staff that he holds, which becomes vital in this episode. To be honest, things get wrapped up very quickly because, one, you have Cecile who is going along with them to help take down the werewolves, but the, the squad, doesn't really, they don't really get involved in the action. And the reason is, is because Deadshot comes up with a plan to take out the staff that Rat Chaser has. After he uses Aimbot to take out the staff, it's pretty much GG. Like, a, the werewolves are no longer under Rat Chaser's control, so that's bad news for him. But I do have a question, because it's made pretty evidently clear. Elves were also allied with them, but they switched sides too. We haven't seen any elves besides the flashback yet. But like I said, I love how the... Beginning of the episode ties in with Rat Chaser being taken down. As they're being hunted down by a gang, they end up taking each other out. So, and Joker goes on to say, Rodents will take out each other. Now, I'm going to go give my final thoughts because we come to the ep end of the episode. And when it comes to like Princess Fiona and the interactions with Harley Quinn, I get the feeling because of certain scenes that we've seen thus far. I'm, I'm going to make a bold prediction here. She's going to like become... The the version of Harley Quinn in this world before, by the time they leave. That's just my prediction. I could be dead wrong here. But the first instance is the fact that Princess Fiona as a child is standing in front of the grave of a, one of her close friends. Yeah, this is an expression that wants to see the, this world burn. She also says she wants this, this war to end. Like, she wants to end it quickly. I get the feeling something's going to happen to her mother. That... 
pushes her over the edge. If that isn't enough to consider, the final visual of the opening is of Princess Fiona falling down into the abyss. So what else would that represent at this point? And there's so much focus on Holly calling her out for being a wimp. And you got like Princess Fiona attending these meetings like, no, I want to be a part of this. So yeah, they're putting a lot of focus on that. So I get the feeling that by the end of this, Princess Fiona is going to be like the, she's going to inhabit the personality of Harley Quinn before they leave. Because it's like a before and after. They look, they did this, the studio did this deliberately to make them ha look identical. Especially with the way that Harley Quinn comes off. She has a way of rubbing off on people. I think Princess Fiona, if something happens to her mother, she'll become unhinged. My main question is this, who's the main villain here? Like this, obviously the show is full of villains, but who's the main one? Is it the female creature that was in, in that tree or in the tree at the end of episode one it also could be amanda amanda wallen is involved in this and they, they sent the previous crew along with rick flag to take a bunch of resources from this world so don't forget that either also you have the explosive devices in their necks that can go off they need to reset those timers and finally the Queen definitely comes off as a villain because as Princess Fiona is trying to talk to her mother after watching the Suicide Squad do their thing, she has this very, I mean, very unhinged look on her face. Like, what is that about? Like, if that isn't the look of a villain, I don't know what else to tell you. The head. I can't wait to see the characters that we saw at the end of episode one. I came within this series with a very open mind much like i did with the very first suicide squad movie which i really enjoyed i may be the only one but i don't really care if i am the only one that makes it even better if that's the case and i enjoyed this i enjoyed the first four episodes i can't wait to see what's next so if you enjoyed this let me know what you guys thought down below if you enjoyed this review hit that thumbs up i appreciate that thanks guys bye